Hi friends, David here from Above AVL and Learn Christmas Lighting. And in this video, we're gonna talk about smart receivers, how to troubleshoot when you have problems with lights on smart receivers. We're getting into the season, the time of this recording or the time this comes out. And one of the top things that we see in our academy over at Learn Christmas Lighting Academy is trouble with smart receivers because you know the difference is going to be when you have a regular controller and it has ports directly on it there are less things that can potentially go wrong with smart receivers honestly it can get complicated I i'm going to be honest with you just to walk down a little history a little memory lane you know smart receivers started with the four port ones from falcon right at least those were the first i were aware of and they're kind of similar to one in the stage lighting industry from a company called Entech. And so, um, you know, they had these four port smart receivers or four port receivers. They weren't even smart receivers. And life was good. Life was easy, just in the sense that if you had a problem, it was there were only a few things you really had to check, right? Like check your cable. And that's my first tip for anyone is with any smart receiver, you know, whether the old ones, the new ones, check your cables first. I will talk about that in a minute. But, you know, as we come into history, then, you know, the smart receivers came around. You could do three in a chain, and they worked with Falcons, and I think they worked with Culps when Culps first came out. And it was huge, and it was a really helpful thing. But it added in a layer of complexity, particularly in the years following up till today. Smart receivers have honestly never been more complicated and more frustrating, and it annoys me because I'm all about making things simpler in this hobby. Here are some of the things that might go wrong with a smart receiver that you need to check out. First things first is you're always gonna have indicator lights. Like I've got one here, it's not really hooked up to power, it's got a bunch of leads into it. But any smart receiver on it somewhere is going to have LEDs. And I know I'm not zoomed in much, but this one for example has LEDs somewhere that show you if it's getting data, there it is, data LEDs on all four of the outputs. Smart receivers in themselves are fairly simple in the sense that they don't really think for themselves. I mean, they do, but they connect to your controller and essentially among an ethernet cable that has eight pieces of wire inside of it in twisted pairs, it gives you four channels, basically four ports that you can put on a smart receiver. So the first place I always look is at those data LEDs. Are they lighting up and are they supposed to light up? In most circumstances, they should be lighting up. Occasionally I've seen where they don't light up if you don't have anything assigned to a port. Um, I'm honestly not sure if that's controller specific or across everything, but check that data LED, right? Are all the ports lit up that you think should be lit up? Is there one missing? Is there one that's lit up that shouldn't be and one that should be that's not, right? Because all of these are symptoms of a bad ethernet cable. Now let's talk about it. Because a lot of times we tell people this and they go, well, I just got this one out of the package. Guess what? When you buy mass manufactured ethernet cables online, a decent number of the places that sell them just frankly don't test them. The factory makes them, they spit them out, they're never tested, right, at all. Um, not for pinout, not for speed anything, right? And, you know, with smart receivers, speed doesn't really matter, but pinout does. You know, all the pins have to be right or else it's not going to work. So there's a few ways to test an ethernet cable. Don't ever assume a cable that worked before or that you got new out of a package is perfect because there's no guarantee of that, okay? One way is I have a Falcon F test here. I love this thing. In fact, we don't sell them. We don't um, really have any affiliation with Falcon. And, you know, usually, honestly, we recommend other brands of controllers, but this little F test is awesome. You know, I bought one last year and you're able to do all kinds of stuff with them, but I believe there is a cable tester in here. No, there's no cable tester, but through any type of smart receiver, you can hook up an ethernet cable, hook it directly to a smart receiver and run some tests on it. So that can be helpful. If you want to check your cable, there are various cable testers along the market. My number one recommendation after trying a lot of them is the Sperry brand one. They make a yellow one. Uh, we'll link to it below, show it on screen here. I tried to find mine. Of course, I couldn't find it when I went to shoot the video. But it is a two-parter two where one side has batteries in it, the other side doesn't. You can pull them apart and put them at two ends of the cable. Um, other testers on the market either are just plain cheap and unreliable, um, which if you're trying to test something, 
and your tester's unreliable, then you really get mad at yourself, right? So for just a little bit more, the Sperry brand one is awesome. The fact that you can separate it, put it at the two ends, they've been really, really re reliable for us and our customers. And they don't only show pin out, so they don't always show one and two, you know, three and four, five and six, seven and eight, but they'll tell you if it's reversed, okay? And a lot of the cheaper testers aren't gonna tell you that, but it matters, okay? Um, so check your cable first. Like 90, I would say a high percentage of people that we run into in our academy that have issues with smart receivers comes down to that. The next problem with smart receivers is gonna be compatibility. One of the things that frustrates me about smart receivers in the past few years is that there have become so many variations of them and they're not like, they don't all just work, right? Like when there were just dumb receivers or standard long range receivers, they always worked with pretty much any controller out there. When we got into the first generation of smart receivers, they could work with Falcons, they could work with Colts, you could use the old receivers, you could use the smart receivers, etc. You know, here in 2024, I know on the Falcon side, there are receivers that work with their newest generation of controllers, there are receivers that work with the older generation, but they really don't work cross compatible with each other. And I understand that there's reasons and there's new functionalities they've built in that make it so that they had to do that. But it does frustrate me because it makes it a lot more confusing for you, the person who's new at Christmas lighting, or even if you've been around the block a few times. So what do we do? You always want to make sure, boy, that something is bright. You always want to make sure that the receiver you have, I recommend buying it from the same place you buy your controller and making sure that the receiver you buy is compatible with the controller you buy. And it's listed from your controller vendor as compatible because there's just, there've become so many different variations, both in time and just in current available models. And you know, some work with some controllers, but not others, et cetera. You gotta make sure they're actually compatible. Next, your switches. Every smart receiver is going to have some kind of switches on it, okay? There's gonna be some kind of switches. This one, for example, has a little switch that you turn with a bunch of letters and numbers, and then there's also termination. Okay, what do these mean? Well, the letters and number switches, the manufacturer should give you a guide to putting it into either some sort of automatic mode or a specific mode for the type of receiver it is. Um, check your manuals on that. The termination switches should all be turned on on the last receiver in the chain. Now, as someone who's worked with protocols similar to how these controllers send to smart receivers, I'm gonna tell you, if you don't turn those terminators on, everything may be 100% fine, but you may run into issues. It's a wise idea to turn that on on the last controller. But if you turn it on, or on the last receiver, if you turn it on, on a receiver that's not the last receiver, it will not pass data through its output port. Okay, so that's really important as well, um, because that's, again, another problem that there might be. Okay, last but not least, or, you know, and maybe this should have happened sooner, I have found occasionally that with smart receivers and controllers, if you have, if you're troubleshooting, Sometimes I've run into this where you have a smart receiver that's booted up and you restart a controller. Sometimes for whatever reason, the smart receiver stops responding at that point. You gotta restart it. So like any good tech support, I say, hey, restart your stuff, right? See if that fixes it. Sometimes it does, as simple as that may sound. So um, those are the basics of troubleshooting on a smart receiver, the things that are kind of specific to receivers that don't apply to controllers or pixel strings themselves. If you're brand new to this hobby and you've never done anything before, then I want to get into your hands a free guide called The Four Things I Really Wish I Knew Before I Began with Christmas Lighting. Okay, go ahead and grab that over at learnchristmaslighting.com. It's going to help you save time. It's going to help you save frustration. It's going to help you save money. And we're going to give you all of that information and show you how we can help you further through our step-by-step -step courses. We're the only place online that has it, and we love to help. Thank you guys so much for watching, and have a great day. See ya.